Good morning and welcome back to Interact Global, uh, the free virtual edition of Nomensa's Interact Conference. Um, big thanks to Rui Koto, uh, Chris Richards and Bern Irizarry for their brilliant talks yesterday. Um, before we kick off our first session this morning, uh, we have coming up a bit later today at 1pm UK time, Lisa Reeves of HSBC with her talk Agile UX and the Design Thinking Model. And at a slightly earlier slot than usual, um, our afternoon uh, slot is at 2pm UK time today and not 3pm. Uh, we have Liz Hubert and Diana Sonis of CX by Design with their talk uh, titled Forget the Trail of Breadcrumbs. Um, there is still time to sign up for those, um, so head over to Eventbrite if you haven't done so already. Um, today is all about innovation and creativity, uh, and what better way to kick things off than with our principal UX designer and illustrator here at Nomensa, Emily Trotter, with her talk The Science of Illustration and Experience Design. Uh, in this talk, Emily will explore the science behind the effect on illustration can have, um, how style can change perception um, and manage emotion, and the practicalities and pitfalls of creating and using branded illustration systems. Um, as always, please join in the discussion in the chat. Um, just make sure your settings are switched to panelists and attendees. Um, and if there's any issues with the stream or audio or anything like that, then please let us know there too. Um, Please submit your questions. Um, I'll run through as many of these with Emily as I can at the end in the Q&A. Um, and finally, we are using auto-generated captions for this session, whilst not 100% accurate live. Um, when we add this to our YouTube, we will make sure they're all tidied up for you. Um, so yeah, um, over to you, Emily. Oh, thanks, Henry. OK, well, welcome, everyone. Um, and. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Um, it means a lot to me that you're giving up your precious time. Um, and I hope I can, I hope you can take something uh, useful away with you from this talk. So science, illustration, experience. These are things that fascinate me. Uh, I've been drawing since I was a child, communicating through drawing and making things. Uh, I find it easier than talking sometimes, so forgive me if I'm not a natural talker today. <laughs> um, but yeah, what I want to talk about um, is the part that illustration can play in user experience design. Uh, I feel like a lot of the value um, that illustration can provide is known instinctively to artists and illustrators. It's like, well, duh, illustration is mega powerful. But sometimes uh, it can be hard to put this into words that can help other people or clients um, to also see the value and ultimately become an advocate themselves. So let me open with a question and a story. Can illustration change behavior? In 2011, there was a problem with antisocial behavior on the streets of Woolwich in Southeast London. Uh, conventional measures have been tried, like CCTV, tougher sentencing, that kind of thing, um, and also the controversial mosquito anti-loitering security device, catchy title. Uh, the gadget emits an unbearable buzzing sound um, and can be set to a pitch that's only audible to people under the age of 25, which is horrific. Um, so in 2012, Ogilvy and Mather Advertising uh, came up with an idea to the aim to be preventative to involve communities and to use the space itself, uh, rather than aiming to drive troublemakers away from the area, which only displaces the problem. So they encourage people living nearby to provide photos of their babies and their children, which were then used by graffiti artists to paint murals on the shop shutters. So as evening draws in, the shop shutters come down, revealing a gallery of portraits of local babies. One of the shop owners commented on the painting of Max, that's the little boy dressed in blue, um, whose image now adorns his shop front uh, at night time. It's been here about three weeks now. Most passers-by who see him smile. I wish we could keep the shutters down and open the shop all the time. That would be ideal. Ogilvy and Mather were working from evidence um, discovered in a series of research papers published around the 1940s that seeing image of a baby's face stimulates a caring response in the brain, even if that baby is a stranger. Uh, they said the evidence suggests that babies' faces, the round cheeks, big eyes, tr trigger a caring response in human beings. So fast forward five years on, 
2017, the Local Government Association published a report on this experiment. Overall, antisocial behaviour had reduced in Woolwich by 24% since the babies of the borough adorned the shop fronts. So, can illustration change behaviour? Yes. And if it can change behaviour, it can change experience. So I've been digging a bit deeper um, into this and to share my findings, I split them into four themes, which um, I'm gonna talk through one by one. So biology um, of vision, how our eyes see and what this means for artists. Then psychology, what we feel when we look at imagery, how our emotions are triggered or affected. Style, looking into the techniques of creating branded illustration styles. And then experience, what this all means in practice when we're designing experiences. So this isn't going to be a biology lesson. I'm definitely not qualified for that. <laughs> I just want to look at a few examples that allow artists to apply science to technique in their work. So I've learned um, loads from this brilliant book by Margaret Livingston. Um, and I want to share three examples um, of vision and art interacting together with you. So this first one, this is a painting by Monet from 1878. So the atmosphere and emotion of the festival in Paris is captured so viscerally in this image, we can almost picture how it feels to be there experiencing it. Um, the flags are waving, the crowds below are like jostling around and um, our minds are probably like assuming the sound of a happy crowd as well, like filling in the gaps. So what Monet has done here is he's painted a mood. When we put this next to a photo of the same street, we can start seeing some key differences. I mean, it's not a like for like comparison, but close enough uh, photo that I can find for discussion. Um, so while Monet painted a mood, the camera has captured a specific moment and frozen it in time. Um, Monet is playing here with peripheral vision. So we have surprisingly low resolution in parts of our, the visual field that are not at the center of what we're looking at. Um, we're not aware of this because we usually move the center of our gaze to whatever we want to look at. The center of our vision is used for scrutinizing detail, whereas the peripheral vision is used for organizing the spatial scene, seeing large objects and for deciding where to fix our gaze next. So the peripheral vision is not blurred vision, it's a loss of precise spatial information. In Monet's painting, he's purposefully spatially jumbled the details. So if you look at the tricolored flags, the red, white, and blue brush strokes um, are not always well aligned um, or even adjacent to each other. And this is not noticeable at first glance because our own spatial imprecision allows illusory conjunctions to complete the objects. In other words, our vision completes the picture and it does it differently with each glance. So the point here is that Monet's painting is designed to mirror a real life experience of vision, a moment in time that's fleeting. Art historian uh, William Seitz said, it's very different from a camera image which would freeze such a scene in a thousand details that no participant could ever experience. So moving on, the second example is about how we focus our gaze. In the 1950s, a psychologist put trackers on contact lenses to monitor where a group of subjects um, gaze fell while they were looking at this painting among others. And it's our peripheral vision again that organizes the spatial scene, decides where to fix our gaze next. So here's the, um, the tracking. What was discovered was that the gaze was drawn to areas of high contrast and areas of biological significance like other humans. So you can see the kind of dark area there where that man was standing and then the eyes tracking up the kind of high contrast areas of the, the rest of the painting. Um, so these findings enable artists to guide their viewers gaze. And using lower levels of detail and contrast in some areas of the painting, and then including detailed facial features, like in this painting, um, will draw the gaze straight to the eyes. So as Margaret Livingston put it, the eyes are a very expressive part of a person. 
In all human cultures, the eyes are considered emotionally important. Monkeys consider eye contact to be a sign of aggression. So finding one's gaze repeatedly drawn to the subject's eyes doubtless produces emotional impact, even though they're drawn there for such an unemotional reason as image detail and contrast. So the point here is that the artists are able to plan their composition using high or low levels of detail and contrast and include human figures to draw the gaze or facial features, in particular eyes, um, to create an emotional connection. So in this third example then, um, Monet's poppies seem alive. They seem to shimmer and move in the painting. And what he's done here is chosen color combinations with um, a low luminance contrast. This confuses two systems of the eye called the what and the where. So the what system can see the objects clearly, but the where system can't register their position and stability, which causes them to jitter and move about. Uh, we can't perceive the edges of those poppies. Uh, when we learned about this at uni, they called it vibrating borders, which I think describes the effect of where the two equiluminant colours meet in quite a nice visual way. Um, and so what this technique, uh, with this technique, artists are able to create an illusion of movement in their work. Um, I just want to give a quick mention to colour theory. So while there are plenty of articles and theories and books um, that will kind of elaborate on the meaning of various colours, there's actually little real research that proves a universal effect of a particular colour on emotions. Um, I think colour theory can probably be very useful if you have a very specific audience base, quite a small specific one, but perhaps use the theories with a pinch of salt, um, don't exclusively use them for meaning um, for a few reasons. So colour can be subjective. Um, colour can mean different things in different cultures. Um, colour can be personal, so colour might have a nostalgic connection or even be negatively triggering. And colour can be inaccessible. Not everyone can see colours in the same way. So if you rely on colour alone, you might be excluding people. On that point, I just want to make um, show a quick example of a really clever use of colour here. Uh, so this like seen, seemingly random palette has been really intelligently selected. Uh, each colour has the appropriate luminance for where it's used on the painting. And um, we can see this clearly when we look at it in grayscale. So all those mad looking colours are perfectly used to depict the shadows and highlights of the portrait. Um, and it might be an indirect result or a happy accident, but this painting is accessible to colour blindness too, which I kind of love. So, can illustration change behaviour? Returning to the question. Yes, when we understand the science of how our eyes see, and apply this knowledge to technique, we can start to control the viewer's experience. Um, which means, you know, my point isn't about trying to play tricks on the viewer or manipulating or being dishonest, but this control allows artists and illustrators to work backwards from a desired intention. And the best part, you don't have to give your viewer instructions on how to look at the illustrations. The biology of our eyes pre-programmed to know what to do. So, that was how artists can collaborate with human biology and influence the experience. Now I want to look at psychology and how what we see affects our emotions and how we feel and how that in turn affects our behaviour and our experience. Most passers-by who see him smile. So this wasn't a whimsical preference of people who like babies. This is a chemical reaction in the brain. Cuteness has emerged as an important factor for attracting caregiver attention and affection. It's a survival instinct. Neuroimaging research shows that the orbitofrontal cortex in adults becomes active really quickly after seeing a baby face, before we even have time to recognize that it's a baby. Um, babies are designed to ignite fast brain activity in regions of the brain linked to emotion and pleasure. So this um, initial fast brain reaction also triggers 
that a slower, more sustained brain activity that's associated with complex behaviours of caregiving and bonding, which are required for parenting. And there are two interesting factors that I want to highlight with this. So first, we're wired to be attractive to, um, attracted to cute things. So the instinct to care um, could be driving our wider perception of cuteness. And this would explain why we feel affection for animals or adults or even inanimate objects with um, sort of juvenile features and even like miniature products as well. So it's not just limited to babies. And the second one, um, by activating the brain networks associated with emotion and pleasure, empathy and compassion are also triggered. So this gives cuteness the power to expand the boundary around what we regard as worthy of moral consideration, affecting emotion, um, pleasure and social interactions. WWF understands this very well. They've assigned cute flagship species to engage people. Obviously their famous panda is one of those. Uh, big eyes, chubby cheeks, and um, see how they're making use of eye contact too, right? which goes back to what we discovered in the forest painting, where our gaze is drawn to facial features and eyes. Without those features, the emotional connection is easily severed. If cute can trigger empathy and compassion, how else can visuals affect our emotional state? So an experience can change dramatically depending on our emotional state and our emotional state can change in an instant based upon what we're experiencing. Um, earlier this year, I spoke at World IA Day about reversal theory. Um, I'll summarize a bit here, but um, the whole presentation is available online if you do wanna find out a bit more. Um, so reversal theory focuses on the dynamic qualities of normal human experience to describe how a person regularly reverses between psychological states which affects the emotions they experience. So there are pairs of these psychological states and only um, one of the states can be experienced at a time. So it's kind of like a switch. The reversal happens when we transition or reverse between them. And a reversal can be triggered by the experience the person is having. So um, I'll look at this pair, serious and playful as an example. Are you motivated by achievement, like buying car tax, or by the enjoyment of the process, like listening to music? The destination or the journey? It gets really interesting when we see how, depending on which state we're in, it influences our experience. So on the graph here, the white line that starts in the top left um, represents a serious state, and the black line in, that starts on the bottom left is a playful state. At the low arousal end of the scale, we could be experiencing relaxation or boredom. And at the high end of the scale, excitement or anxiety. So excitement and anxiety are both states of high arousal, but the difference in what we experience is vast. And that's what you can switch between really quickly. So to add some context, Monzo use illustrations to add value to the experience of using their um, banking app. But the way they use illustration is really considerate to the state the user is likely to be in. Um, so they have their fun and like charismatic mascot, Hot Chip, this little guy here who's winking at us, but they use him really sparingly. Um, Hot Chip is reserved for one-off uncommon moments such as like onboarding success or receiving your new bank card. These are moments when a task has like definitely been achieved and the playful scale can be like safely pushed towards excitement. Um, this limited exposure to hot chip also ensures that their brand mascot is perceived as like a special a treat, a reward. So within the app, slightly more like low key illustrations are displayed along with articles or new features or help topics. Um, so these are moments when the user is probably not in the middle of something, but they might still be in a more um, serious mode. So the illustrations don't get in the way of content, um, but they do help to like peak interest or communicate the vibe of the feature or content they accompany. They help to keep anxiety down um, keep people on the relaxation end of the scale, 
And they might even switch the user to a playful mode, in which case they'll be um, open to discovering something new. Day-to-day -day transactional use of the app, like making payments or checking your balance, um, feature no illustration at all. <clears throat> These are times when the user is focused on the destination, completing the task at hand, and would not appreciate an illustration slowing them down or blocking their way. Like hot chip can be like, you know, our little fun character can become annoying very quickly if he's um, in the way of something. Um, so, I mean, that's an example of how we can respond and respond to and switch emotional states. But what about the images themselves? What do we look for in an image? So when specific detail like um, a specific person or place or object needs to be communicated, it's almost always best to use a photograph. For example, buying a physical product or booking a hotel, you're gonna to wanna to see a photograph before committing to buy, right? But when it comes to conveying an emotional mood, setting a scene or a more abstract concept, a photograph can become distracting because of its specific detail. So just like we found when we compared Monet's painting of Paris with a photo of the same street. <clears throat> And photos of people can be a tricky area to get right as well. Um, again, there are use of cases when it works and those when it doesn't, depending on the context. If the intention is for us to um, relate to the mood or experience, a photo can be a turn off. The parameters of similarity um, are so small when you're looking at a photo of a specific person or models um, that a large chunk of your audience might feel excluded by that. Um, as Alice Lee, who is one of Dropbox's designers, um, said about the decision for Dropbox to stay away from photography on one of their products, she said, we realise a disjoint that users experience when they look at photographs that are of people that aren't them. It's instantly unrelatable. So Airbnb, um, on their homepage, are evoking an emotion here by using a narrative. They're using a fictional image with a loose style to be purposefully evocative. The intent is the feeling of adventure and newness at the beginning. And the style of this illustration lets us know that this is a moment in a story. The level of detail tells us the forest is a fiction. The characters are inconsequential. What's important is the possibility of discovery and of starting our own story. If, we, if they were to use a photograph of a similar composition, the view is able to see much more detail. They can see this as a real location. Where's the forest? Can I visit it? Like already the thought process is narrowing down when they see this. And our understanding of photography means we know that the people in the photo actually exist. They come from a culture, they belong to a class. Um, our subconscious is making um, connections and assumptions and filling in the detail. So we might connect to this scene or we might not, but it's probable that these assumptions have already distracted away from that intended emotion of the image. So we look at illustration in a different way to photography. And as a result, we experience illustration in a different way. So consider carefully like the purpose of the image, the intent of the experience, and use that as a rationale for your decision. So our perceptions are often being built and managed non-consciously. Right? Think of um, an art, yeah, our behavior can change depending upon an image or a visual stimulus. Think of the, uh, the save icon. Apparently two thirds of children don't know what a floppy disk is. And yet, you know, it's not gonna stop them learning its function and using it anyway. Um, you know, behavior becomes autopilot. Um, so this bike company, were getting complaints from customers when their bikes were being damaged during delivery. Uh, their fragile labels weren't working on the packaging. So they tried this idea of um, using a picture of a widescreen TV on the box instead. The image change led to 80% fewer damaged bikes um, on arrival. So um, I wanna end the psychology section with this. Um, a bit of research that I found fascinating. So if an experience is considered as aesthetic, 
This seems to allow for more mixed emotional states, which might be an exploratory basis of a seemingly paradox that negative emotion in the arts is sometimes enjoyed. Felt negativity does not go away, but can be more positively experienced in an aesthetic context. So my take on this is um, psychological, psychological safety. When we understand that we're looking at art, we know that art is subjective, and therefore we know it's safe to have an opinion. In fact, it's more than safe, it feels good to have an opinion. Even if we don't like the artwork, we can enjoy that negative emotion because we're in control of it. So going back to my question, can illustration change behavior and experience? Yes, illustration can be used with care to manage situations by complementing emotional states or gently nudging emotional states and to build connection with empathy. So changing gear a little bit now, um, style and technique. Let's look into the techniques of creating a branded illustration style. Back to basics, what is a brand? So we'll cover this off. Um, it's a person's perception of a product, service, experience or organisation. It makes sense, right? So the important thing to focus on here is the first part, a person's perception. In other words, it's not something controlled by the company, but something controlled by the customer. The company can design their brand and their product and their service and their communication, but that perception will be defined by the overall experience the customer has. A brand image has to express the company's message and connect with users who should instantly recognize it across different media, even away from their company website and marketing content. A strong brand image is like an anchor helping to facilitate customers attachment and fix value associations. So a brand experience then is the interactions people have with the service or the company and the brand identity is the outward expression of the brand, the visual appearance or including the visual appearance. And an illustration style is an element of that brand identity along with you know, the other assets like the logo, the typeface, uh, photography style, animation, tone of voice, it all works together as one. <clears throat> so brands utilize illustration styles um, because of its power as a visual communication device. Think about everything we've looked at so far, like being selected with detail, the illustrator is in control of the composition. Everything included is there by purpose, by design. Um, illustrating humans creates that connection of empathy and without using a photograph of a person we can push the style to be more inclusive. Um, complex ideas can be communicated in abstract ways that just aren't possible with other medium. Reality can be suspended. Style choices like line styles, shape styles, textures can all produce different personalities. For example, painterly hand-drawn marks um, create a perception of human involvement. In 2016, one of Facebook's like real early illustration styles was centered around um, paper craft, so actual paper cut and folded to create forms. Uh, I couldn't find an example of this, but, um, but yeah, you can imagine what that's like. And Kristen Spillman was hired as a design director at that time um, by Facebook, and she said, what was rooted behind that approach was that it was important for Facebook to show that there were people behind the products that were being built and that this craft showed imperfection. A notion that it wasn't just robotic and technical in terms of what this product offered, but it was made with care. It was made by people for people. And the paper craft kind of embodied that materiality, the tactile qualities of the human touch, and also just the opportunity for imperfection. But the paper system introduced some new challenges because you need a really specific skill set um, in order to do that. So um, when Christian was hired, hired, she soon made changes and moved away from the paper cutouts, but kept a hand drawn line element you know, to retain that kind of human touch. And she described that systems thinking design process that enables scale as 
defining the right balance of constraints that lead to the maximum amount of expression and flexibility while still feeling like it's coming from the same place. So what Kristen was demonstrating when she joined the team at Facebook to help them scale their illustration style was the importance of considering the scalability at the point of inception. Uh, last year, I was part of a team at Nemensa who um, we designed a new brand for a new financial service. It was like a banking and investing app um, aimed at young people for a, a bank in Switzerland. Um, we bought a new brand to life, which included an illustrative, illustrative style. Uh, the style of illustration came to life organically at first um, as like a reaction for a need for visual cues during certain complex journeys. Um, but it became more and more of a feature in the design of the product and then beyond into the marketing. This was largely due to the nature of the product. Like finance can be complex and dry and illustration helped to achieve the brand's core aim to be simple and uh, educational so that the user feels free. Um, as we've discovered, illustrations provide value. Uh, so your audience doesn't need to learn how to interpret an illustration, there's no language barrier. Um, they enable storytelling um, and illustration also provides the power to create the reality you want or that your brand wants. Traditionally, illustration is commissioned on a case by case basis, which is time consuming and requires a qualified illustrator each time. So instead of single use designs, illustrations can be used as part of a comprehensive visual system with like versatile reusable elements. Um, images in an illustration system share a unifying mood or style, which makes them identifiable with the brand's wider image and message, even as they represent different aspects of a product or service. So we designed the U illustration system to increase the range and depth of messages the brand can communicate visually. And from mission statements, practical product support, all the way through to like merchandise, and all the while strengthening that brand image. So what does an illustration system need to do? To satisfy the brand, it needs to look consistent um, throughout the illustrations, as well as um, across the wider brand. It needs to look and feel simple and easy to understand, and it needs to appeal to and feel inclusive to the audience. But to be useful and usable, the system needs certain practicalities. It needs to be broken down into small elements um, that are um, easy to use, to swap in and out and to compose. To ensure variety, um, it needs to enable creativity and versatility. Um, so there's got to be guides to help people use it confidently and to ensure consistency, there must be rules to follow. So to achieve a look that was simplistic and scalable, we started with the basic shapes inspired by the logo as building blocks rounded shapes combined with simple straight edges. And then everything in the universe is created with these as a starting point, which ensured the style was consistent as it scales. So an example of how that works. So um, first assemble some basic shapes with a rough idea in mind of the pose you're trying to create. Compose the basics of the pose. Use um, negative space from the shapes as well as positive space. Make adjustments, duplicate and reposition elements to keep that consistency. And then add detail, like hands, feet, hair, colors, patterns. So slowly we built up an illustration, only adding what's necessary to commu uh, communicate the pose and still using those original shapes. Defining the right balance of constraints that lead to the maximum amount of expression and flexibility while still feeling like it's coming from the same place. There are many different like open source free to use illustration libraries out there. Um, and you know, there are definitely times when a quick stock illustration is a good solution. But what using these libraries will not enable you to do is strengthen your brand style. Using a stock illustration might satisfy an immediate goal on a micro level. But if you zoom out to the macro holistic view, um, and the, the company that's using stock illustration could be anybody. The stock style is made to be generic. It's um, so usable that it's, it's you know, used by other companies frequently in other services. Remember that a brand is a person's perception of a product, service, experience, or organization. 
If the brand style is generic, it won't be capable of making that lasting impression, that connection with the customer, and it will be forgotten because it can't be distinguished enough from other brands to be remembered. It could be anybody. Similarly, copying is another shortcut to damaging perceptions. Now, I'm gonna level with you. I get a huge amount of enjoyment of um, ice cream vans with badly painted Disney characters on them. And I guess this is like uh, the enjoyment of that negative emotion effect. I understand that it's just um, an art, it's not gonna, you know, I can have an opinion and I, I love it. The worse it is, the better. But my point here is that copying a star is gonna lose its original intentions and it will be noticeable because without the foundation of those original intentions, the consistency and flexibility rules will get muddled. Changes will happen in the wrong place. Rules will be bent and pushed. And every time that happens, quality and integrity is sacrificed. When quality is sacrificed, the experience will feel unconsidered, like Pluto's foot there. And when the experience feels unconsidered, trust will be lost. And with that, the brand perception will be negative. So can illustration change behavior? Yes, create a consistent, recognizable illustrative style that belongs to a brand and you'll build trust and connection between customer and brand. So we've come to the last section, experience. And really experience has been discussed every step of the way so far. So what I thought would be useful here is to summarize a few takeaways about what this means in practice when we're designing experiences. You can use illustration to change experience. And I'm gonna use these four words to give you the takeaways. Connect, consider, scale, and test. Connect. Use style and technique to connect with the viewer. Selective detail, eye contact, the power of cute. Illustrate a mood and emotion. Headspace illustrations are so well designed and placed that they've connected with users on an incredibly deep level. Their whole experience are based, is based upon that relaxing voice, the illustration and animation, and their ability to simplify and diffuse complex and sometimes distressing subject matter. Their brand style accurately reflects their product and the results are proof of the brand value. Connect by being purposefully diverse and inclusive. For the U brand, we aim to create environments in which any individual or group can be and feel welcomed or respected. The U app is about breaking new ground. And I wanted the U people to reflect that mindset by not conforming to traditions or attempting to categorize people. The range of options were designed to make it easy to encompass different character characterizations for each individual person. Remove barriers to connection by providing options. There are nine heads to choose from, and each person can be customized by choosing one of the four skin tones and a hair color from the palette. And then each head can be used on any of the bodies, um, enabling a vast number of possible combinations. Consider. Spot opportunities within the experience to utilize illustration, moments of brand engagement, decision points, visual explainers, educators, or celebration. Unconsidered can amplify a negative. So I had this experience recently where, um, well, it was a bad experience all round with a taxi booking app. Uh, it wasn't Uber. <laughs> and then was after this bad experience, I was immediately prompted by the app to leave a review. So I left a very honest review. It was at 5 a.m. and I was on my way to the airport. So yeah, it was very honest. <laughs> and when I pressed submit, I was greeted with this celebratory illustration saying, woohoo, thanks for your feedback. Um, and that was the nail in the coffin for me. App deleted immediately. Nothing to do with the quality of the illustration itself. It was the moment, the experience that was the problem. They'd only considered the happy path with no consideration for any other scenario. Considered can create positive change. Don't saturate with illustration, be cheesy, 
be intelligent, be rational, cultivate how you want the brand illustration style to be perceived, special, helpful, calming, educational, dial the mood up or down to reflect or manage your user's emotional state. An illustration used in an experience should always have a job to do. Scale. Use systems thinking right from the point of inception to build an illustrative style that sits comfortably with the wider brand while being consistent enough for a team of people to use it and flexible enough that it enables creativity and expression. And test. It's important to clarify that we're not testing illustrations. We're testing the holistic experience. An illustration is a part of a whole. Isolated subjective opinion is not helpful. We're not asking, do you like this drawing? Because as we've discovered, it's about the style of the experience and not whether a person likes a particular illustration or not. So think of the job the illustration is designed to do and observe if the participant is able to achieve their goal. This is quite difficult because as creatives, it's tempting to focus in on the creative parts of our work that we fear the most. Um, just like Mr. Bingo and uh, Wilfred Wood pointed out in their Venn diagram, we're naturally looking for validation e either way. So in testing, stay rational, observe, and focus on that holistic experience. So can illustration change experience? Yes. Yes, it can. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. I, yeah, I absolutely love that, especially the yeah, that bike company, the TV on there, the box to stop them getting damaged is that's genius. Yeah. Um, uh, if, if anyone has any questions, please, please do submit them now um, uh, using uh, using the Q&A function. Um, and I will run through as many as I can. Um, so Emily, you mentioned um, kind of the design system um, that we created for you, kind of when kind of, you know, handing the keys over to them, kind of so to speak, were there challenges in communicating how that kind of illustration system should be used? And uh, yeah, could you kind of speak a bit more on that? Yeah, sure. So um, actually some of the slides that, that I included in this were, um, a part of the handover presentation that I gave to their, their teams because, you know, we'd spent all this time putting the system together and thinking about how it should be used or like trying to maintain that maximum amount of like flexibility, um, but also consistency. So um, I did, yeah, kind of spend probably more time than, than necessary, but like really put together this, this presentation to their design and marketing teams of the client um, to talk them through all of the rationale behind it, um, make sure everybody was on board, but also like really importantly, to make sure they understood that I was handing this freedom over to, to them as well. So I showed them a, like a demo of the library and um, you know how everything can be composed and moved around and how it can be exported for different, um, different formats as well. Um, but also just kind of made sure I was doing this with the, the attitude of like, this is for you, you know, you're the creative director now and you, you know, you have the power and, um, and telling them like, I'm, I'm really excited to see what you come up with with it as well. And I think, you know, that must have been successful because I, you know, I, obviously I, I kind of follow them on Instagram and other places online and I, I see them using this, the library all the time and it's really exciting to see the stuff they're coming up with. So yeah, I think it's that, um, you know, making sure that they, they feel that energy and freedom to, to experiment themselves, you know, giving them, like you say, handing over the keys. <laughs> also, yeah, I suppose it is that kind of the kind of, like, like what you were saying about flexibility and constraint, there's kind of enough constraint there, I suppose, that is kind of quite quite simple to kind of hand over those keys. Mm. So, like, yeah, that's, and sharing uh, those rules as well, like making sure they understand the constraints. Um, yeah, so it's all there quite clearly. And, and kind of speaking on kind of that flexibility versus constraint, kind of like how hard is it 
to kind of find that balance and kind of kind of how do you know when you're getting it right or wrong um well i guess it, it just takes experimentation like um you know putting this library together we had you know we had quite a dry list of deliverables for the for the project where we said you know we will deliver x number of people x number of backgrounds and x number of, of props to use and um but actually what we handed over was like way way more than than that because as i was um designing it um it got to this point where because we'd been experimented with, we're experimenting with those constraints and those rules, it kind of organically got to this point where you you just understood the system of it, and and it was so fun to create new things out out of the the constraints and out of the rules and and to kind of push it that you know we we ended up handing over way more than we we could have done. So I guess. I don't know, I guess it just takes experimentation. And then the second part of that is, um, is seeing how people use it. So, I mean, the, we handed that over a year, over a year ago now, and we're kind of in conversations um, to, to see how they're getting on with it, see what holes there are to fill or, you know, things they might not be using and understand why they're not using those, those bits and pieces and just to see how we can evolve it. So, you know, nothing is going to be perfect dead on straight away and it's that continuing that conversation and that collaboration with their teams to make sure um, that you can evolve things in the right way as well to make sure they're still able to create those experiences so yeah I hope that answers that question. <laughs> Thank you um, so uh, we have a question here from uh, Alina, um, who just asked if there's kind of any articles or books um, that you could kind of recommend um, kind of on this um, on this topic. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, this so this was the, the vision and art book um, that I mentioned in the presentation. So that I mean, that one's more about, you know, the biology of how we're seeing and the effects. Um, the techniques that artists can use but when it comes to like illustration and user experience design there's an excellent podcast um, called how to build a startup um, which is yeah really really interesting and some of the quotes that I, I kind of surfaced in this presentation came from people being interviewed on that podcast and it's it's all about using um, illustration in um, product design so I'd really recommend listening to that and um, I mean, there are, there are so many articles online if you look for them as well. Like um, uh, just in research for this project, I found way more brands using illustrative systems than I even realized were. I mean, I, I think at the beginning of this year, um, Burger King released um, or had a new illustration system designed. And it was really interesting reading all about, about that. I know that like Skyscanner have an illustrative system um you know there, there's so many of them and like just yeah have maybe have a google for it i can i can share a few of the articles i found in the research for this for this um presentation as well but um but yeah definitely that how to draw a startup podcast it's a couple of years old now but there's still some really relevant stories and experiences in there awesome thank you yeah we can yeah if you want to share them and we can share them via elements or interact accounts as well so um, so yeah, thank you. Um, yes, we have another question here, kind of uh, another one from Alina who asks, uh, what are the ways and metrics we can use to measure the impact illustrations have um, on the overall experience? So, yeah, this is one that I've um, been kind of thinking about a lot um, as we're using illustration more and more in, in user experience design. And, um, and that's kind of, the reason I added test on as the final kind of takeaway, because I think I was becoming quite focused on, you know, like I explained, like focused on isolating the illustration and trying to test it as a metric in its own right. But really it is about the whole experience, right? You know, you're not, you can't take one piece of the style away. You can just, you can, uh, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take all of the copywriting away, you know, it's, you need to like, look at, 
you test journeys as a whole that have an illustration in them. Um, and then if somebody succeeds with it, you know, with flying colors, then, you know, that's great. It's all kind of working. And if not, then, then you need to dig deeper into, into why and not put words into people's mouths. But I think, yeah, it's about, it's about, yeah, considering it as a whole, I think, I think is, is what I'm trying to get to. So not, not getting hung up on the fact that you're using illustration is, is probably the main thing here. But if you drill down into an issue somebody's having, uh, or you get lots of like a worrying amount of feedback that is mentioning illustration, and it's um, and you dig into that and find that people are feeling excluded, then you know that's that's where you need to start um, tweaking designs or you know testing with or without and and really like focusing in on it. Um, yeah, so I hope that's kind of a helpful response to that one <laughs> awesome thanks i mean i mean you mentioned kind of illustration kind of being used more and more you actually kind of relates to this next question from um from Innes, who says uh kind of will it will illustration kind of kind of keep growing in ux in the future i suppose kind of is it um and i'm kind of asking kind of is it a kind of a good field to be in kind of moving forward um, well, I mean, I, I definitely say say yes. Like, um, it, it's again. I think I think there's this odd perception of illustration being this um, this kind of alien thing, but really, it's just one of many ways of communicating. It's um, you know, it shouldn't be considered something crazy and different. Like, you know, would you be asking the same question about photography, for example? You know, it's. Um, it's it's just another way of, of expressing something and communicating something and like anything else um you know it, it there are certain contexts where it works really well and there are contexts where it doesn't um you just it's about the way you use it but i think you know it, it, it at the moment it's definitely kind of trendy which is why we're seeing a lot of these um free open source libraries popping up that I kind of mentioned in, in the presentation. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's something to be aware of as well, because, uh, you know, people love to hate as well. And like any kind of trend that comes and, go and just goes in design is going to generate conversation and generate people who, who dislike it. But I think the important thing is to stay um, agnostic of that opinion and to focus on the brand and the experience that you are designing at that point in time and um, and work out whether illustration suits that particular experience or that particular brand. But, you know, illustration has been going strong for a long, long time, you know, through all sorts of, of um, different guises. And, and I think it's probably more that, um, you know, tech is getting more and more um, advanced and um, it's it's just becoming a more recognized way in this industry of um, creating those connections and that empathy. And also like the actual technology of um, exporting illustrations, you know, you can, you can export things as and create things as like SVGs or, you know, built, built of code rather than JPEGs and PNGs. So that means that you know, you're not actually slowing the experience down, you know, by taking long loading times or um, wasting power in a server somewhere, you know, it's, you can think about whether things are better for the planet as well, you know, if you're building an SVG rather than a JPEG, then, you know, that's, that's going to be better all around. So, yeah, I think technology is like facilitating some of this growth as well. So, so yeah, I would say it's definitely you know, an interesting field to get into and, um, and one that's not going anywhere. Brilliant, thanks. Um, so we've got one more question um, uh, and they ask, uh, do you have any specific passion projects that inspired uh, or have um, inspired projects at work? Um, yeah, probably passion projects. So I do, um, my day job is, is obviously what I've just explained, but, but yeah, I do um, illustration and stuff on um, in my free time as well. And I've, you know, I, I create drawings. I've, I've got a 
um, I sell t-shirts with my designs and things on and I, and I do kind of actual paintings like murals and stuff as well. So, um, and I think like those are my passion projects and obviously, you know, what if I'm doing them on the side, then I've, you know, my brain is engaged in two, in, you know, different types of design at the same time, which always helps to enrich something that you're designing in the day job. Um, like being aware of this wider world of possibilities, but also things like, um, you know, last year I was really inspired by Grayson Perry's art club. I don't know if many of you watched that, but um, just that conversation of people creating artwork and what it means to them. And, and I think some of the results of that were really surprising where some people that he picked, so basically he, people were submitting the imagery and he was, pick, Grayson Perry was picking things to put in a gallery um, and take on tour and some of the stuff he picked like the people just wouldn't have expected to be picked because it was maybe the first time they've ever drawn anything in their life but it's like there's something um, about the piece of artwork that really communicates or connects um, in, in, a, in a, a poignant way so I think just art in general, going to galleries um, or looking at art on the street or just finding funny compositions in life and just being aware, keeping your eyes open, like anything can inspire you really. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so we've got one more real quick question from Helen um, who asks, um, what apps and software do you use for your illustration? Um, so I use quite a few different things. So I actually do um, quite a lot of stuff um, sketching with pencil first and foremost um, but then I'll also use um, I've got an iPad and an Apple pencil which comes in quite useful um, those the ones that you saw for the U app were designed um, with kind of vector shapes and gradients and things and I actually did that in sketch which is more of a um, uh, like a, a design tool for designing like apps and, and websites and things but you know, it's, it's, it's got similar tools to like Illustrator and Photoshop, um, so which I also use as well. So I, I think it uh, is, I guess there's different tools that are useful for different types of design, but really, um, you know, if you want to create a vector, there are lots of different programs you can use it in. If you want to create something, you know, a PNG or something that's, that's more hand-drawn, then, you know, there are the iPad's good for that or um, or doing it physically with pen pen and pencil and you, you can use an app on on your phone um, Adobe Capture which you know you can turn like a line art into a vector um, just by taking a photo of it and it, it puts it into your Adobe Illustrator library so yeah I try and use as many tools as possible because I think it's dangerous to um, limit yourself to one type of thing um, and usually you know tools are competitive with each other so usually they're quite intuitive as well so you can do a few tutorials and pick things up quite quickly. Thanks Emily um, and yeah thank you to everyone that tuned in um, yeah we're back at 1pm um, with Lisa Reeves from HSBC um, with her talk, uh, Agile UX and the Design Thinking Method. Um, finally, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we are hiring our design team. So uh, if you're looking for a new challenge and would like to work with Emily here, um, then yeah, um, do go uh, head over to nomenta.com forward slash careers or drop us an email at hello at um, So yeah, Emily, thanks again. Um, and thank you to everyone. Um, we'll be back at 1pm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.